All right. Okay, and um, so the link to these slides, I'll just pop that in the chat, just a sec. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, so I hope that is the right link. Um, Kaylin, I dropped these um, in the folder for this design study night. So if, okay, this link, okay. if there are any issues, I'll hopefully you can help figure that out. <laughs> yeah. um, but so today, welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about accessibility. I'm really excited about this topic. Uh, we only have about an hour to talk, so we'll cover some things, though not everything. And um, we're really going to get started, um, you know, talk more broadly about accessibility, and then we're going to dive into some accessibility implementations. Um, and we're just going to take a look at some code and take a look at some tools to sort of help with all of that. And we are going to have a breakout session, but I decided to put the breakout session sort of in the middle. Um, well, two thirds of the way through the presentation, just because I felt like that would break everything up a little bit more. Um, so yeah, and that exercise that you're all going to do together is going to be on CodePen, so that should be kind of fun. Uh, but let's, before we do that, let's get started talking about accessibility. Um, so I know that um, Kaylin has introduced me. Uh, it's it's great. Uh, it's really funny to, to listen to yourself being introduced, but hi, it's me. Um, I do teach uh, about computer science and web development and accessibility, and um, this is sort of an extension of that, I guess. Um, you'll have to let me know what you think of um, this one hour talk on this topic. Um, Kaylin, I'm going to turn, I'm going to if there are questions that come up, I'm going to rely on you to okay. yeah. ask them or you or Sarah Joy or um, anyone else. OK, so accessibility. Um, so I'm going to start with this quote from Tim Berners-Lee and that the power of the web is in its universality. Um, so access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. It's how the web was built and it's really our responsibility as we continue building for the web to continue to make it as accessible for everyone. Um, so what is accessibility? Uh, one thing that I do want to mention before we get into that is often you'll hear this shorthand A11Y and it really just stands for um, the 11 letters in between the A and the Y. So if you've ever wondered about that, that's where that comes from. So accessibility is the practice of creating web experiences that everyone can use. Websites and mobile applications should be accessible um, to people with a diverse range of hearing, movement, sight, cognitive ability. Also, it is, you've probably heard a few different headlines around this topic, but um, there have been several different lawsuits on different companies because their websites are just not accessible enough. Um, this is part of the ADA Act, and so it is important to not just um, implement accessibility I mean, it's important to implement accessibility, obviously, for everyone to be able to use websites, but um, at least based on the laws of this country, it's also a requirement. So in terms of accessibility, um, so around 61 million adults in the US live with a disability. So that's something just to put this, um, to put this in context, it's, there are, um, out of the entire population of the US, that ends up being about a, a fourth of the US population. So that's a huge number. Um, these are not just edge cases or stress cases. This is just, um, this is really for a huge uh, percentage of the population. 
this is also from the CDC. This is another infograph infographic essentially um, outlining the different types of disabilities. Um, so we've got mobility, cognition, independent living, hearing, vision, self-care. Um, we're going to focus on some of these, maybe not all, but just keep in mind that there are several different, um, different types. Uh, but beyond, you know, when we talk about uh, accessibility and disability um, specifically, often we really only focus on permanent disabilities. And so I wanted to bring our attention to inclusive design, which is this framework. Um, it's um, this inclusive design framework that was developed by Microsoft. And um, the idea here is that while there are sort of permanent disabilities, often um, they're also temporary and uh, situational um, disabilities or uh, limitations to ability. And it's really important to realize that when we, when we do develop and we, when we do implement for accessibility, we're not just focusing on people with who are in this category permanently, but we're also focusing on people who are in this category temporarily or situationally. Um, and so, for example, in terms of in terms of sight, we have a permanent disability being blindness, a temporary being a cataract, a situational being a distracted driver. An example that comes, an example. Um, Another example of this that you've probably come across um, are uh, ramps to buildings. So essentially they were built so that people using wheelchairs can access certain buildings, uh, but they're also being used you know, by new parents who have a baby in a stroller. And so what, how we, um, whenever we do have, whether it's in our software or in our everyday lives, whenever it is that um, we do implement um, accessibility solutions, we're not just focusing on permanent um, disabilities. We're really focusing on so many more people than that. And um, it's even more important really that we take that into account as we develop. So in terms of, um, so some of the disabilities and impairments in terms of um, that were, that reflect a little bit to the implementations that we're going to talk about later on, we've got visual, auditory, motor, speech, um, cognitive. Now I want to start with visual. And again, in terms of visual impairments, what we're really talking about is, you know, the first thing that you might think about is blindness, um, but we also actually have low vision. We have color blindness. Um, we have age-related issues. We have monitors with incorrect color rendering. Um, so as we think about how, um, as we think about these um, visual implementations um, for various different impairments, um, there's so much more than just blindness specifically. Um, so specific uh, things to help with visual impairments, we have screen readers, we have braille displays, um, the ability to zoom in on various sites or mobile apps. We have high contrast colors um, to make that differentiation clearer. Um, in terms of auditory things um, to implement for our websites, we have captions on videos. Um, and in fact, I think, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure if this is something that we can turn on for this call, but usually Zoom does allow you to have a transcript. Um, so if anyone does have any sort of auditory impairments, oops, one sec. Um, that transcripts might help with. Um, there is that ability in Zoom. Um, and then transcripts. Um, so transcripts are usually generated after a video has been posted. And you know sometimes they're auto-generated. Sometimes they're actually um, written out by various people. Um, 
motor skills. Um, so this may include disabilities concerning movement or neuro neurological genetic disorders that lead to weakness or loss of control in limbs. Um, so what we have here is uh, speech to text software, keyboard only interactions. Okay. Uh, so keeping all of that in mind, we're going to talk essentially about the web content accessibility guidelines. So this is this technology agnostic document that the W3C has put out. And this is really guidance for implementing all things accessibility. Um, this is actually technology agnostic. So, um, you know, this also applies to various documents um, and other things. So we have a few different versions of this and, um, you know, starting with 1.0, uh, we're actually in the US 2.0 is, which came out in 2008 is actually um, fairly common. Um, so that's about 38 requirements, which includes uh, 1.0. And then we have essentially like 2.1, which came out a few years ago, um, 50 plus requirements, including the ones in um, 2.0. And this has already been more widely adopted in the EU than in the US, um, but I think we are headed there as well. And then in terms of levels of compliance, so we've got three different levels. Uh, we've got um, just the A and then the AA and then the AAA. Um, so A essentially removes major barriers for those with disabilities. Um, AA, which is what you're gonna see quite often in terms of implementations, uh, are going to essentially remove um, this lowest level of compliance as well as the next level of compliance, which is major barriers for low vision. And then AAA is really the um, highest level of compliance. Now it's a little bit harder to achieve and several of the specifications outlined in AAA, um, you know, haven't really been implemented for a lot of websites. I do, I do want to take a quick moment to actually take a look at these, um, all of the, all of the guidelines that are specified within these three different levels. Um, and so that's essentially all listed here. And um, this link is available in the slides, but maybe I should also post, this is like a really important one. So maybe I'll post it in the chat as well. Got it, thank you. Uh, but lots of, um, yeah, anything that you obviously, um, quite a few different specifications. And if you want to read more about something, um, there's, there's a description in here. So let's go back. Okay. So um, in terms, there's also this acronym before we kind of dive into sort of more implementations, I also just want to take a few moments and um, the, um, the WCAG actually talks about um, these specific guidelines in terms of putting together accessible sites. Um, the acronym is POOR and it's essentially receivable, operable, understandable, robust. Um, so perceivable means that all visitors have a similar experience regardless of ability. Operable means that all controls and interactive elements are usable. Understandable, content is clear. Robust, content can be accessed with a wide range of technologies. Um, now there's also just, there's more descriptions um, at this link. So if you want to sort of read more about the guidelines, I. Um, I, I want you to be aware of it, but I don't want to necessarily spend too much time on those specific guidelines. Um, so keeping all of that in mind, I wanted to put together a list of some of the first, um, some of maybe the, the more, um, maybe like the, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of accessibility implementations. Um, because obviously, depending on the websites that you're building, um, you know, there's quite a lot to take into account. Uh, 
but a lot of different accessibility issues are really going to be focused on these um, on these specific implementations. So I think it's really important to be aware of them. So uh, I think we've got about um, eight or nine of them. And so one, uh, use, using semantically correct markup and not changing native semantics. So semantics refers to the meaning associated with specific elements. Now, um, we've had elements such as div, which semantically don't really, a div semantically does not actually tell us a whole lot about that specific element. Uh, versus another element such as header is going to add more semantic meaning. And several, several new elements were introduced as part of HTML5, um, specifically to add semantics to our HTML elements. Elements also come with native semantics and it's important to not, uh, to use those elements properly and then also to not change native semantics. Um, alternative text for images. This is a really important one too, and we'll see some examples. Um, using high color contrast and not always relying on color alone to convey meaning. Um, so high color contrast is really gonna make it easier to, to perceive the text versus the background color versus the background image. Designing forms with labels, and this means essentially associating specific input elements with um, a label that's going to describe that specific element. Uh, using ARIA to add semantic meaning to markup when necessary. Um, so when we are building custom elements or whenever we are working in an older code base, um, and we don't have access or it's not possible for us to use the most semantically correct um, element, that's when we can essentially start adding ARIA for extra semantics. Navigating with focus. Um, so that's essentially if, you know, if, if there is any sort, this can be a preference, but it can also be some sort of um, motor impairment that, I mean, some users um, will navigate through a website with their keyboard as opposed to a mouse. Another really important thing is really testing out our pages. Now, no matter how, no matter how we implement everything, there are always going to be limitations. And um, especially when we talk about how someone with, um, you know, like low vision or um, blindness is going to be able to navigate a specific websites. The best thing that we can do is really use a screen reader to test everything out. Um, and then beyond that, we also have the ability to run accessibility audits and automate some of this testing. Um, so this is not really going to catch every single accessibility issue, but this is going to um, help us help us find a lot of those specific issues. All right, so in terms of semantically correct markup, um, so again, as part of HTML5, several new elements were introduced and the purpose of those elements was really to add semantics. Um, another way to think about semantics is, um, you know, when you define some sort of variable in JavaScript and you have, um, you know, like let A equals 10, um, and that A maybe is supposed to refer to the area versus um, defining something as let area equals 10. Um, so one is going to be, is going to um, essentially add more semantics to that definition. And it's really the same issue that we're dealing with here um, with HTML. Another, uh, in terms of semantics, the other thing is that HTML has these six headings, so H1 through H6, and um, every page is expected to have one H1 element, which is really going to be the main heading. It's not a violation if your page does not have an H1, but you will get a warning whenever you run an accessibility audit, and that's just because we essentially um, the, the expectation is that your page will always have an H1. Um, as for the other headers, uh, they should on your page, 
you can have more than one H2 through H6, um, but only one H1. And the headings must appear in chronological order. Um, in, um, so one of the things that that's going to happen when, when you do divide up your page in, um, with elements such as, you know, header, footer, aside, main article, um, you know, fig, uh, or figure, fig caption, all of those, um, or section you know, all of those new elements that were introduced as part of HTML5. Um, what you're gonna be able to do then is to also associate different landmarks to them. Um, so with divs, your landmarks really aren't gonna work in the same way. And the important, and the reason why we add landmarks to our pages is so, so that we can easily navigate a website. This is the web aim website. And when you open up a screen reader, what you're gonna have is all these different sections within the page. Um, if you are navigating with a screen reader or if you are you know, potentially even tabbing through different elements, you might have to do a lot of tabbing to get to the specific um, part of the page that you wanna be in. Uh, but once you start using uh, these semantically correct elements, you can as essentially associate them with different landmarks. And we'll, we'll see landmarks a little bit more when we talk about, um, when we talk about ARIA. Um, but uh, essentially this is, this is an example. Um, so whenever you have specific uh, HTML elements, you can, um, they have these default landmark roles. You can also add specific landmark roles and that's essentially going to divide up your page so that someone can quickly with a screen reader jump between the different um, areas on your page. So let's take a look at an example. What we have here is, um, you know, when we talk about semantically correct markup, let's let's actually see an example. Um, so this is you might actually there's there's quite a lot of HTML out there that really looks like this, and um, this is not great in terms of accessibility, but there's plenty of it out there. So what we have over here is we have this div with a class of section, and then we have a div with a class of article and a P with a class of heading one um, and a P with a class of date and a div with a class of a side and then um, you know a heading two or a P with a class of heading two and then a UL and an LI. Um, so lots of things are happening here, but the main thing is that we're really using um, the thing that I think is really important to remember here is that having something like class equals section or class equals article or class equals heading is um, semantically irrelevant. Um, this class doesn't actually add anything to these elements. The class really refers to CSS and um, this yeah, this is not good. Um, so let me let me sort of like open, uh, make this into a more interactive uh, session. What if you were to sort of rewrite this code? What are some of the things that you could update um, to essentially make this code more semantic? Does anyone feel comfortable coming off of me for this one? Or you can set it in the chat. Oh, we have Gwen said, uh, use section for the first div Are instead of the class. Go ahead. Using HTML tags instead of div tags. Mm -hmm. Is that a good use of that, Katerina? Uh, so the section, uh, the section, yes. Um, but what do you mean by HTML tag? Like the div like is an HTML tag. Of, 
you have a class of heading one, you could actually use the H1 tag to define that as right. heading. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely. What else? Like the div um, class article, you can use the article HTML tag instead. Yep. Yep. There's um, there's a bunch of different. Um, essentially, pretty much uh, most of these divs and uh, p tags. This is actually something that we can replace uh, with more semantic markup. With the um, you have p class date. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you answered my yeah. question. All good. Yeah, there's, there's a lot available. Um, so just, um, you know, this is all things that we can essentially update. And um, there's just more semantic meaning associated with this code as opposed to the code that we saw previously. Um, again, it does, there's a lot of code bases out there that were written like wait, what was on the first slide. Um, but you know it's our responsibility from now on to to stay as far away from that as possible now there's in terms of semantically correct markup there's another one um, and this is a pretty big one um, but essentially again this happens in a lot of code but it, um, using a div um, instead of a button uh, or using a lot of other types of elements including the um, anchor tag um, instead of a button. And this is one, um, the div is really not just, it doesn't have that same semantic meaning. It doesn't have the on-click event, uh, but same thing with the A, um, the anchor tag. Um, anchors are really meant to be used for navigations and buttons are meant to be used uh, for actions. So um, if you have, uh, unless, unless this click me is supposed to navigate you um, to a different page, uh, you should really be using a button or you can use an input type button um, or various different um, input types that are gonna be uh, button-like. Uh, this is also, this also happens pretty often. I mean, I don't know how often, but it certainly happens where you essentially have an H1 with a class of H2. Again, um, this is essentially trying to change native semantics and it's just not a good practice. Uh, another way to change native semantics is to really start adding um, various ARIA attributes. And so, for example, if we have a header and we wanted to make it into a button, uh, you know, you can just, you have this role of button. This is not a good idea. Again, um, just adding a role of button adds button semantics, but it's not going to add some of the behaviors associated with a button or an input type button elements, including um, the various, you know, like event types associated with it. Uh, same thing with the div, um, just you can add the role um, that's going to add semantics, but again, it's just like missing some of the behavior. Um, up next, we have alternative text for images. This is, uh, I, so I teach, I've been teaching web development for probably two years at this point. Um, and I've been teaching accessibility this entire time and still I can't get all of my students to do this, even though uh, um, it's such an easy way to ensure that um, people are aware of what's happening in a specific image. So the alt, um, to understand what's happening in a specific image, we have to use this alt attribute. Uh, anytime you have a, an image, there should be an alt attribute that is going to describe that specific image. The only time you can have an empty alt attribute when, is when you have a decorative image. So a decorative image is going to be something like, uh, maybe you have, you wanna have, um, you know, this, this image of like this blue blue line and you just have it as an image and there's just like no meaning associated with that image. So you can leave the um, alt attribute empty for that. 
so when creating the alt text, the text should contain the message you wish to convey through that image. And if the image includes text, that text should also be included in the alt attribute. And the alt attribute is going to be really important for someone with a visual impairment. If, if someone is using a screen reader, um, they're not going to be able to obviously see what that image is. The only thing they're going to be able to see um, or the only thing they're going to be able to, to understand is what the text that the screen reader reads. But it's not just for people using a screen reader. This also um, this is also important whenever someone is using a slower internet connection or um, in the past, if you were if you were at like a music festival and uh, you're surrounded by people and you're trying to load a page and the images aren't going to load because so many people around you are also using that same connection. Um, whenever images don't load, the, the only thing that's going to load is going to be that alt attribute. Another thing is if the image is accidentally deleted or the image file path breaks and nothing shows up, that alt attribute will show up. Um, up next, we're going to talk about uh, color contrast. And there's two. Um, so we have essentially this double A and triple A. Um, so text and images, text and images of text should have a contrast ratio of at least uh, 4.5 to 1 and 3.5 to 1 for large scale text. Um, triple A is 7.1 and 4.5. Um, so what does this mean? Essentially, you have um, your four, you have your text, and then you have the background. And if this is small text, um, again, whether you're focusing on AAA or AA, that's either for small text, that's either going to be 4.5 or 7.1. Um, so what that means is this is this is there isn't enough contrast, there isn't enough contrast, this is enough contrast for AA, but only this is enough contrast for AAA. I really recommend that you focus on AAA just because um, this text can still be difficult for some people to see. And this image from, comes from this site. This is also if you want to take a look at um, different color combinations. Again, you can run an accessibility audit, but if you're just, uh, if you want to go through the different, let me just click on this. Um, if you want to go through different options, um, you can essentially uh, uh, select a background color. So let's see, let's try to do this color and see what happens. So now essentially you've got um, yeah. lots of fails. This is really only gonna work for double A for large text. So it's not great. Um, so what you can do is make this, I guess make this, keep changing it until you get a color combo that is actually gonna work and that's gonna offer enough color contrast. I really recommend uh, going by the AAA standards, which is really gonna be uh, um, um, seven to one and then a 4.5 to one, seven to one and then 4.5 to one. Another thing to keep in mind that, um, so beyond just um, taking a look at um, text on background that is just one color, um, it's really important to, um, there's a little bit of background noise. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna like mute some folks. Uh, so another, another way to think about this is that sometimes you're not actually gonna have just like a white background. You're not gonna have like a black background. You're gonna have a, some sort of background image. And, um, and you also have to check the text against the different colors on that background image. Um, so for example, we have this white text, which works really well on the dark blue, but it doesn't really work well on whenever that image has a white background. Um, this is a pretty cool tool to essentially, um, you know, kind of like figure out uh, where should I move my text to, or should I change, should I make this image a little bit darker so the background colors are a little bit darker. 
So again, a few different options, but. Um, we did have a question uh, from Laura. Um, I found my site can fail the wave test, but pass on web aim double A. Is wave triple A? Does that make sense? I can read it again. Yeah, it does make sense. So. Um, so we can take a look at an example. I think that might um, maybe make it a little bit easier to sort of see um, if you, well, actually we can do it here. Um, let's, uh, so essentially as we click on, uh, let's take a look at this color. Um, if you, in terms of the different, in terms of the different, um, errors that it gives you, you can actually click on everything and get more information. Um, so you can take a look at like where in your code this is happening, but if you also want to, to essentially get um, why you're getting this specific error, um, this, is, this is the error that's happening. Um, so in this case specifically, the um, what's listed here is double A. So it's, you really just have to take a look at um, each error specifically to kind of understand why it's giving you a specific error. And I do want to mention that the different automated tools, I mean, they're just like tools at your disposal. And, um, you know, I think they're pretty consistent in terms of, um, you know, like trying to run something on one, on, like one website versus another, but sometimes it can be a little bit, it can be slightly different. Now, if we go through and, or actually let's, let's do, let's inspect accessibility. Um, so if we go through this and let's check for contrast errors, um, again, um, you essentially, this is the feedback it will give you in terms of um, so this is 2.59. Let's see if, if another one is 2.54, one point. Okay. Um, so it looks like all of these are below 4.5, but again, um, anytime you're going to like click, um, anytime you, anytime you aren't sure why you're getting a specific error, you always have sort of like the learn more, which is actually going to tell you more information about each specific, um, each specific error. And again, I think I also have, I have Chrome up and running just in case so that we can run our different accessibility audits. Um, so if we like inspect, I don't know, let's do, let's do Axe. Um, and like run this page and again we're just gonna we're just gonna see all of these and uh, yeah so it looks like all of these um, all of these are essentially um, so we got the six so <laughs> I guess we got the 2.68 and it was slightly different in that we had, was it 2.68 on the first one? It was like slightly different. So again, um, these, these tools are gonna be slightly different, um, but in general, you know, uh, unless you are super close and if you're like super close to that, you know, like 4.5, maybe you just wanna make sure that you, you aren't that close to it. And actually, I just, uh, I'm just like looking and seeing the question in the chat as well, but like uh, web aim is wave. So it's actually the same thing. Um, it's just that one is a website and one is a browser extension. Maybe you could check the settings that you use when you run the tests, um, make sure that um, like the certain options for single A or double A or triple A standards are checked. 
not sure why they would be giving you different. Um, I'm not sure which tools you're using and which settings you're using, on, um, but it seems like you're getting some mixed results there. Hopefully that helped. All right, so let's go back to um, let's go back to the slides. I just want to make sure that um, there's a lot to color. Um, color isn't like most of these slides are about HTML, and color is the only one that's CSS. But color is such an uh, such a big part of it, and um, making sure that you have the right contrast, and also making sure that the color you have on your website is per perceived properly is so important. Um, so the next part that I want to jump into is really color blindness, um, because we don't talk about this part of um, designing websites enough. Uh, but people with color blindness are unable to see uh, to fully see certain lights. So again, we have um, Roy G. Biv, and these are going to be our different colors: so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, um, indigo, violet, and people can perceive different uh, wavelengths. Uh, differently. Um, color blindness affects approximately 1 in 12 men, so 8% of the population, and 1 in 200 women. Um, so common enough that this is something that we should um, take into account as we design our uh, web experiences. Uh, for an illustration of what happens with color blindness, so this is when people with normal vision can essentially perceive all the different colors of the light spectrum. Uh, and so we essentially have all those, all these different colors here. Uh, but depending on, so these, um, the red light, green light, and blue light are gonna be some of the more common um, issues with color blindness. So it's essentially not being able to perceive red light or green light or blue light. Uh, but there's other types of light that someone might not be able to perceive. And so what happens is that you kind of like, this is what you see in, instead of these colors. And this is what you see instead of these. Um, so it's important to be aware of that. People who are really savvy can use specific filters on their laptops, their mobile devices, so that they can still perceive color properly. Um, but a lot of people aren't really aware of all of that stuff. So um super important um that we take that into account uh one of the examples um one of the a really great example of um making sure that that even someone who has color blindness can fully understand how something works um well, well, part of it is essentially not relying on color alone because that's not going to be important. That's not going to be helpful enough. And one of the examples for that is essentially like our stoplights. Um, so we have the red, um, orange, or yellow, and green. And it's not just that we have those specific colors; is that those specific colors are going to be in that same order. So we're going to have red at the top, yellow, and then green. And we're not going to have red and green and then yellow. Like that's. Um, it's just we have. Uh, the specific guidelines around how to build those specific um, lights. And if we have something, um, if, if instead of like on top of each other, they're right next to each other, we're gonna have like, you know, like red to the left and then uh, yellow and then green. And they're always going to be in that order. Um, and it's sort of, as we think about our websites, it's sort of the same thing where, if we have um, if we have an error in this text field and we're really just using red color um, as the border for a specific element, that's really not going to be enough. Um, someone who can't perceive red, like we'll just see this as a different color. Um, so that's that's really not going to be enough. Um, so we want to have something where maybe we have a description of the issue. Uh, maybe we also have some sort of icon um, with, you know, some sort of like warning or some sort of error, maybe the exclamation point, maybe the X. Um, again, various different cues to understand that behavior beyond just color. Another example of this is essentially Trello, how, um, you know, if you're someone who can perceive the green and the yellow orange um, and all of these colors, you're good, but some people can't. And so adding texture um, is going to allow them to potentially see the differences between those different colors. 
Um, another thing to keep in mind, you know, like going back to this, depending on the color scheme that you pick for your website, sometimes you might pick, um, like maybe you decide to pick red and uh, red and green. Um, probably not because it's not a very popular color scheme, but let's just say, um, and you think maybe you're building some sort of charts um, on some sort of dashboard with a bunch of different charts on your page. Um, if you're using that particular color scheme, someone isn't really gonna be able to see that much of a difference between the, diff the, the colors that you're using because uh, maybe they're not, being, they're not able to perceive those colors properly. So what you wanna do in those cases um, is essentially use the same, the different hues of the same color. So if you're building your charts with, for example, like a light blue and a dark blue and a darker blue and like a really dark blue, um, essentially having that same hue uh, for the different you know, pieces of your pie chart is actually gonna be easier to perceive for people who have specific color blindnesses um, or specific color blindness than um, having different colors if those colors aren't. Uh, perceived well. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, so the last thing that we're going to talk about before we go to our exercise, I know I've been talking quite a bit, um, is essentially labels and labeling our specific elements. Um, so the idea here is that whenever you have an input element, that input element does not have a label associated with it. So there's essentially, there's, there's nothing to explain what that element is. Um, so if you have an input type email, input type password, again, you need to also have a label that is going to let the user know what that input field is. Um, so in specific situations, it may be acceptable to hide the label elements visually because maybe, maybe you just wanna have, um, maybe it's like not necessary to have that label, but you still wanna have it in your code. So in terms of um, this labeling, um, so, Again, you'll see this in code, um, but essentially you have oops, you have something like this where you have username and then input um, ID username, type text, name username. Um, but the thing that happens with this is that um, this input element is not actually going to be properly associated with this username. The only way to do that is to actually have an explicit label. Now in here, you could use like a P tag, you could use a div, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just, it's still not gonna be properly labeled. Um, instead, what you wanna do is either implicitly labeled or explicitly labeled. Um, so whenever you're doing implicit labeling, um, the, oops, sorry. Uh, the implicit labeling works really well if you have an older code base and you just wanna essentially add these labels. So you have this code over here, let me get the pointer. So you have this code over here and essentially you're trying to make it more accessible. Um, the Probably what you're gonna see in a lot of cases is you essentially just kind of like wrap all of that inside of a label. And then uh, essentially what that's gonna mean is that this, whatever this text is, is gonna be labeled um, within this input element. Uh, so that's gonna be fine. It adds extra accessibility um, to your, to your implementation. The better option is to explicitly label all of your input elements. So you essentially, uh, you have this label, it's going to have this for attribute and whatever you, um, this for attribute is going to have to match up with the ID um, attribute of your input element. So if this ID is username, your for attribute should be username. If this ID is email, this for should be email. Um, okay, so let's 
let's go to this. I feel like Ready. I've been talking quite a bit. <laughs> um, so I think what we should be doing next, um, so we have essentially this form and, you know, um, forms and images and, um, you know, semantic markup. These are, uh, these are some things that are going to be pretty easy fixes, um, but I think it's important to make sure we're aware of how to do that. Um, so I just put this together where, you know, this looks like a form, uh, but what we want to make sure that we do is, um, you know, make this a little bit more accessible than it is. Um, so I'm going to post this, um, I'm going to post this link in the slide or in the chat. Um, so Kaylin, if you wanted to just like assign people to like, I don't know, maybe like a couple of uh, breakout sessions, I think it would be mm -hmm. really nice to give everyone, um, you know, the opportunity to kind of take some of the things that were talked about in the slides and then um, implement those here. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to start. Um, I'm just going to do automatically um, and then hopefully Katarina or I can jump into um, the rooms and make sure that one of us or I can just assign manually. Let me do that. Um, so let me do that. I'm going to put Katarina and myself in another one with uh, Sarah Joy as well. Um, and then I'll just put a few of you in there and a few of you in there. Um, I'll go ahead and open the rooms and then it should give you an option to jump right in there. Um, see you in there soon. And I'm going to join my room. I'll be back. Um, then, Katarina, are you going to take a quick break? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to grab some water. Yes. <laughs> okay, go for it. I'll join your first room then. Okay. okay.
Hey, Katarina. Hey. I realized that I did not put a time limit on the okay. breakout rooms. So how okay. long? They're about like 10 minutes right now, I think. How How are people doing? Um, ours were good. Um, we wanted to, I mean, we were confused a little bit about the newsletter one, which I figure you did on purpose. Um, Cause like the label or the question asks, would you like to join the newsletter? But then the label and the checkbox itself are like, like we figured that you put the label with the input with the, the yes with the input, but then we're like, what do you do with the other label, you know? So that one was tricky. Yes, that was on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm curious about that one. I didn't know the answer. And then we had a QA engineer who does this stuff. So she was kind of our, our resource because I I'm a, I don't know much about it. I'm trying to learn. Yeah. Um, but I think we did okay. I'm sure there's stuff we're missing. Um, I think people could keep going for a few minutes. I kind of popped into the other one. It looks like they were also asking kind of the same questions. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can we can come back to the main. We can. That's totally fine. Let me. I can go check out the rooms again and see if I can just. Um, should I say we'll wrap? We'll return to the main room in like two minutes or something. I can send a message. Yeah, that's out. fine. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that would be good because we can we can maybe spend the next like five to ten minutes going over potential things to address. Um, and then, um, okay. I sent a chat. I said, we will return to the main rooms in two minutes so we can just hang out. Um, how have you been? Good. Good. We've been checking in <laughs> outside of volunteering. So with the on Trung and then oh yeah 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 okay. yeah seems like you've been busy oh are you still recording right now um it looks like I am okay I'm gonna pause that. welcome back hello, hello. hello everyone Hello, How hello. was that? Seems some thumbs up. <laughs> A little tricky. Okay. So, um, yeah. So in terms of, well, first of all, let's take a look at sort of like what's happening here. Um, I just opened up. Oops. We're going to take a look at Safari as well, or at Wikipedia as well. But before we do that, I just kind of open this up. Um, or let me open it up first in Firefox. I think I did get this open. Um, so that we can essentially run wave, like a wave audit on this. Um, so this is really going to come up with about four different errors. And this is essentially the, the different things uh, you wanted to address. But again, uh, it's not really going to catch everything. It's just going to catch some things. Um, so, um, yeah, so these are basically going to be some of the bigger things to, to keep in mind in regards to this. Um, and in here, let's see. Let's do, um, let's do voiceover or... Are you all able to see that? It's a little gray window that says you are currently on, oh, and it's going to zoom stuff. And then I see like a rectangle kind of floating around the screen. Um, Kaylin, uh, I'm actually just gonna, uh, um, just voiceover actually just picks up everything. Um, so um, I'm just gonna do a quick demo of this. I'm gonna, I'm going to stop it and then I'm going to take your questions. Um, yeah, so we essentially get like Rachel Murphy has left the meeting because again, it picks up everything. So not just uh, Safari, but also things that are happening in Zoom. I was trying to clarify, what are we supposed to be seeing? Uh, 
Okay, so I just uh, I just wanted to sort of like run through what happens as you tab through the different elements in VoiceOver, which is a screen reader. Does that answer your question? I'm scared to talk because I think that affects things for you. Um, I'm not really sure what's oh, happening, gotcha. but I'll, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you can't, uh, so I think, okay, um, so I'm just going to ask you not to put that stuff in the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn it down. Um, okay, so you couldn't hear that. And I think I need to change, um, I need to change my video settings um, to pick up. Um, you know what, I'm actually not, uh, I'm not going to do that right now just because I'm not entirely sure. I think I need to like stop this um, and like rejoin with different settings. Um, so I am going to open voiceover, but the thing is when you do like, um, when you open voiceover, you essentially have um, the voice that essentially tells you a lot of different things. You can actually mute that. Um, and then you also get essentially this little um, pop up that kind of tells you as you go through the different elements and I'm just gonna, if you can't hear the voice that's fine, we can just take a look at the different options um, that it's showing on the screen. Um, the voice actually does so when you when you post in the chat the voice actually does pick that up so it does get like really noisy to try to do this in zoom with a lot of people. Um, but since I'm the only one who can hear it, I'm the only one for whom things are getting super busy. Um, so let's, I'm just gonna open it up again and, all right. Okay, so essentially um, this is the form. This is the same one, but I just opened this up in a browser and um, see, I, and essentially, we're just going to navigate through the, the different input elements with this. And so, um, control options down. Okay, one, one sec. Um, okay, so what's going to happen is as we go through the different elements, you're going to hear what um, the screen reader um, shares about that specific element. Um, so, right now, we're essentially on a text field. Um, if we go to the next one, oh, what's happening? Um, so essentially we have edit, uh, and that it's the edit is because it's an input element and then we have text blank. So it's an uh, input of type element and then it's blank. And then we have the same thing, input and uh, type text blank. Um, and then we have yes, um, checked checkbox. And then we have, um, it's not even picking up our submit. Um, so obviously a lot of different issues in terms of like things it's not picking up and also in terms of um, not actually getting any information in regards to name, email, and would you like to join the newsletter? So these are the things that we're trying to address. So I'm gonna close this for now. Uh, so to open up, so I use VoiceOver because I find it, I like it better than other ones. Um, so VoiceOver on Macs, I believe it's just like um, Command and F5. Um, it might be different on another operating system. It might also like the commands might be slightly different if you're using a different type of screen reader. But um, if you, it comes already in, if you are using Mac OS, um, I, I just find it easier to use. Okay, so now that we got a little bit about, um, essentially what's the, the same thing that we saw is really, uh, some of these issues um, that really weren't getting picked up through the screen reader. So what are some things that we can um, change in our code? What, what, what were some of the implementations? This is the collaborative part where you can just um, put things in the chat or just unmute yourself and um, Does anyone want to get us started? Use um, for and IDs for the labels and inputs. Okay. Uh, so what uh, what should I do here for this one? 
uh, for for name. And input would be ID name. Okay. Uh, what about, I guess let's do the same thing here. Um, and then, um, is there anything else that we should do with this like form control? Use form fill. Looks like Rachel wrapped the label and input in a field set tag, the class form control. So basically, uh, change the divs to field set. Um, okay, why did you do that? I have to wait for them to type here. I like the star in the name. <laughs> I should try that. That's fun. Star, Rachel. Hey, yeah. Hello. Um, so one of the group members in the breakout session shared this link, um, which just showed that you can group um, labels and inputs together. Um, and so we chose to, to go and try that, it allows like each um, element to sort of be squared off into its own sort of section on the page. Okay. Um, I would say that's, that's probably unnecessary for this um, because again, what we're trying to do here is um, label these, um, label this stuff together. Um, the, the field set and the legend become really important. Well, the field set actually becomes really important because whenever you wanna add multiple labels to a specific input element, um, there, there's only one label that you can associate with that element. And um, like in, in our next example, where we have the checkbox, we essentially have two different things. We have the yes, but then we also have, would you like to join the newsletter? Um, so there's actually no way to associate two different labels. and the way that we can do that is by specifying um, a field set by um, adding all of those different elements inside of a field set and then using the legend uh, for the question for the question for the different check boxes. Um, so um, what I was going for with my question was actually in here you have an input type text and um, as it turns out, this is actually not an input type text. This is an input type email um, because we, again, we have all these different, uh, different types of elements available that we can use. And the input type text is just not gonna be um, the most appropriate one for this case. Uh, whenever we do add the input type email, what happens is that if we, um, well, I guess I can't do that just yet um, because we don't have us, we, we have to do the submit first. Um, so um, another thing that I wanted to add in here, essentially, we're also going to wrap everything inside of a form. Uh, in fact, we're just going to add the image inside of the form as well. Um, because again, we are just trying to format this. So the spacing. Uh, what's happening code? Ben? <laughs> okay. Um, Let's do this again. I might just have to copy this over to VS Code because CodePen is just like not cooperating right now. Okay. I don't know why everything is so slow. Uh, that's not good. Okay, let me just copy this over to um, 
It looked frozen, so at least you can copy and paste it. That's good. Yeah. Bye, Jillian. Okay. Let's see. I guess I'm gonna like add this in here. Just, uh, okay. So actually, let's just also. Okay, much better, okay. All right, uh, so we're gonna have everything inside of a form so that we can essentially submit the form. Whenever we, uh, whenever we submit the form, there's essentially gonna be automatic uh, checking that happens for the email. Um, so in terms of like the submit, uh, what we can do here instead of this div class, we can actually, oops, um, input type, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, input type. Submit and let's see, um, value equals, I guess, click me or submit me. Let's just do submit. Um, so now if we, if we just open this up, Well, for one, I think we've like fixed a couple of the issues, but the other thing is like, if I, um, if I wanna turn in like Katerina and Katerina and like submit this form, we get this automatic error checking um, that just, it's slightly different in every browser, but there is this automatic uh, checking that happens because we are using the right element. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the field set in here. So field set. And I'm going to wrap um, this checkbox in the field set. And in fact, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to make um, not checked. And then or I guess, no, let's, it's probably not necessary. But um, let's see, let's, let's save. And what do I have? I feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and kill this. No. Okay. Okay. Um, everything can be a little bit slower when I'm like sharing on, um, when I'm actually sharing on Zoom. I'm just gonna do this myself. Um, okay, so instead of label, just because again, we can only have the one label, we can, what we can have is essentially wrap this all up in a field set with a specific legend. And in here, I guess we can do an ID of check box and then a label for checkbox. All right. And now when we take a look at this, um, essentially, this is our, um, this is our field set. The field set is in HTML. It's essentially going to add this border. This is something that we can just delete with CSS. Um, but it's just going to happen whenever we um, when it, it's just like the style that's associated with the field set. Um, so now whenever we essentially run our, um, whenever we sort of check all this, this is an error because obviously we want to me.com. Um, so then we're not going to get the error whenever, um, whenever we do enter an email, um, for this image, we're missing the alt tag. Um, and essentially if we go back and take a look at this. I'm just gonna like reload. I'm gonna like reopen voiceover because I just want you to see what the difference is in terms of the checkbox. Let's see.
Okay, did I? One sec. I think this has not been uploaded. Um, yeah, this is not, this is not uploading. Um, oh, you know why? I know why, because, because we open up a new file. The file is like the name of the file is slightly different. Um, okay, so that's, that's our new file. So in terms of like opening this up, so now, so now we essentially when uh, when we do so a couple of things happen. One, uh, when we click on name, because name is associated with our input field, um, our cursor goes directly into this input element. Second, um, in here it actually tells us. Um, that this input field has a label of name. So when we go to email, it tells us again, it's email. It's not just like text. Um, and then when we, oops, um, and then when we go in here, uh, what we have is essentially our label. Um, but because we have all this wrapped in a field set, um, it, the, the legend will also get read. Um, so we're currently on a, well, I guess it moved already. Um, but we have yes, check checked checkbox. Would you like to join the newsletter? Uh, would you like to join the newsletter group? So if we had like yes or no, those would each time we uh, we go through each one of those checkboxes, it would actually read up um, the legend associated. So we would get that question. Uh, so that's where oh, and then. Uh, we essentially have um, submit as a button. So I'm going to turn voiceover off. Um, so this is essentially um, uh, how like a screen reader is gonna be able to interpret um, these different elements on our screen. Now, the last thing that we should probably do um, is also add like an alt attribute. Um, um, thank you for answering. Um, so let's say this is an image of, um, I, I obviously don't have this image length, but let's just say it's just, it just says thank you. So then we have this alt. So then um, essentially when we reload, because the image isn't loading, what's going to load is gonna be that alt attribute. And in fact, we should actually specify image um, saying thank you for answering and in fact I'm going to add a couple of breaks in here um, anyway so that's essentially how we can take our form and just make sure that it's uh, if there's uh, uh, more accessibility implementations added to it we did have one question, this. yeah, on the image, the class GIF. Was that something we should assume had a class definition somewhere else, or was that sort of trying to serve some purpose that we should? I mean, had? like none of these, like we don't have any CSS, so like you can actually delete all of these, but like a lot of times you will see these. I mean, this is this is just like how a form might actually be formatted. So, uh, yeah, just CSS. Hi, Anna. Um, some people are dropping off. Um, the last okay. question that came up um, was like name, how name is different from for and ID. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay. So this is a form and what we're doing with this form, what we want to do with this form is essentially submitted. Um, with forms, we're essentially taking user input and we're sending it to a server. Now we don't have that implementation, um, but what happens is when we submit this form, we're essentially creating an HTTP request that is going to submit this information that the user is submitting to a specific server. So um, let's go back here and let's say we actually put in like I don't know, Katerina and then Katerina um, at pdf.edu. 
And then I'm just gonna open up DevTools so that we can kind of like see what's happening and go to network. Um, so when we submit this, uh, what's gonna happen is we get this get request that is created. Um, and this get request, uh, not, well, we obviously don't have everything that we need implemented. So that's one of the issues. Uh, but the second is that we actually don't have any name attributes. So whenever we do want to, um, whenever we do want to submit a specific form, um, so uh, by default, our method is going to be a get, but we can actually just specify it in here, or actually let's put specify post. Um, and let's specify our action is like submit. Um, and so as we submit this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a name field. Well, well, that was the question, right? The name attribute versus the ID attribute. Yes. Okay. I'm not just answering questions that weren't asked. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, and in fact, instead of doing name, we're going to do username just so that it's a little bit like, um, so that's a little bit like clear for all of us. So I'm going to update it here too. Um, okay, so now uh, what I've done over here is I've essentially set up the name uh, because when we submit the form for the value that the user inputs to be associated with any sort of label, um, that's when we need the name attribute. So let's reload. And then let's do again, Katarina and cat at me.com. And then let's submit. And now we're essentially going to post. This isn't going to work because we can't, we don't have a server, which is why we get this 405. And it's essentially a method not allowed. Um, and in here, uh, I wonder if we can't see this because we haven't actually implemented our server. Um, oh, here we go. So um, the data that gets submitted is essentially going to be this form data. And um, what we have over here is essentially this username. Um, and this is part of our payload. So for the server to, you know, just because the input, the user inputs like Katarina or whatever email doesn't mean that it's actually going to get um, going to get added to this payload unless we specify the name attribute. And so actually I'm going to go back and uh, just so that it's like really clear so that it's even clearer. Um, and then in here, I'm going to do like email address. Um, and then we're going to like reload this. Resend. What just happened? Oh. Yeah, so it also it it moved uh, it moved us to the submit. Uh, what what what? Let's just go back this way. Much better. Okay, so now we can just again submit all of this stuff. And in fact, let me just delete all of the different requests and then let me submit. Um, so when I submit this stuff, did it not submit? Did something happen to our, oh yes, something, there was an error that I just didn't catch. Um, okay, but that looks the exact same. What happened to, what, what happened to our, okay, I'm gonna stop it and restart it. Okay. I, I don't know what was going on, just um, something happening. Um, so in here, let's do, um, this time, let's do SpongeBob and sponge at world.com. And then when we submit this, what's gonna happen is um, inside of as uh, the form data that gets submitted. So this is the user input, but it has to essentially in the payload, um, this is this, this is the exact thing that gets sent to the server. Uh, server side, what we have to do is essentially parse um, this payload, uh, but the, the, the form data associated with this payload is really going to be the name 
the name attribute that we define uh, for this name field as well as for this uh, email field. And this is the data from the user. Uh, so this is essentially what gets sent. Um, the ID is something that we can use. One second, one second. Okay, I just had to turn on the lights because I was disappearing. Uh, but the ID is something that we can use with CSS. It's also something that we can use with labeling. The name attribute is really whenever we send information server side as part of the form submission. Cool, I didn't know that. Uh, so the action you can specify, the action is really just your route. So you can specify whatever you want. It doesn't have to be submit. We can just be like SpongeBob. It opens so the door to many of, fun code pens. Um, yeah. So um, just what, what, whenever a form does get submitted, uh, what happens is it's um, by default, it actually gets sent to a new route. So you can essentially specify different routes. So I don't know, let's do SpongeBob. Um, so you can essentially set up these uh, different routes. And what's happening is that on your main route, essentially you're submitting this form. This could also just be like, I don't know, the form route. And, um, and on submission, you're essentially redirected to a new page. Um, so let's see, I guess like, um, reload um, and then like let's submit this and essentially now we're uh, the the route that we're submitting on is uh, spongebob forms are fun <laughs> could be a whole other uh the study night, I think, just doing forms all day. Yeah. All right. So I know we're running a little bit uh, low on time. Um, so there's a few more slides, but feel free to take a look through those. Uh, or I guess we could just quickly sort of go over a few different things. But I do want to make sure that we have um, we have some time to run some accessibility audits. Now, in terms of uh, ARIA, ARIA essentially stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. This is a way to add semantics um, and it only adds semantics. And so um, it doesn't really change the DOM. It doesn't really add anything about, um, you know, like specifying something with a roll of button doesn't actually make it like clickable. Um, so just a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, there's like a landmarks example. Um, there's also essentially uh, whenever we define area semantics, uh, we have the role, what is it? We have a state, what's happening to it, property, what's the nature of it? Um, so in terms of, you know, whenever we create custom elements, this is really when we can start using ARIA. Uh, because for example, we wanna create, we wanna use this ally as a checkbox, because again, it's probably part of a custom element. Um, in that case, what we want to do is we want to, um, like, this is, this is not enough. Uh, what we want to do is really add this role of checkbox. And then if it's checked, we want to add the state of ARIA checked uh, equals true. Um, a screener will essentially pick this up as well as um, whether something is checked. And then there's, um, you know, there's oops, various... Um, you know, we can add a role of navigation. We have various different um, ARIA properties that we can add as part of our attributes when we do want to add extra semantics. Now there's also navigating with focus and that's essentially uh, for whenever we use a keyboard to just like tab through the different items. Uh, for users who cannot use a mouse, uh, we want to make sure that the website is going to be equally accessible through the keyboard. What we want to do is essentially press the tab key. Um, elements such as input field button select list um, are implicitly focusable, which means um, that they have a, um, a tab index. 
Um, so they're automatically inserted in the tab order. Other elements such as paragraphs, divs are not. And so we actually, if we want to make them focusable, we have to add uh, that tab order. Um, another thing is if we want to like style um, this like uh, hover pseudo class, we can do that with CSS. Now, in terms of using screen readers, um, they are used to present on screen information in a different format, primarily audio. Um, many people can use them. Um, some examples of screener, we saw voiceover. So that's, um, that's something that you can use with macOS. Um, start and stop with command F5. Um, and then there's essentially like control option um, down. There's also essentially control command U to see the landmarks. I have to look at the keyboard. I've just gotten used to where the keys are, but then I, I don't actually remember what the different keys are. Um, there's also Chrome Vox, which is gonna work for Chrome, Windows, Mac OS, uh, NVDA for Windows, Orca for Linux, and there's several other ones available. This is an example, you can sort of walk through it. Um, it just, you can, you should be able to figure out what the site is just from listening to the screen reader. Um, this is a demo. This is actually someone who uses screen readers. Um, it's, it's a, we can just watch a few seconds of this video. Um, but essentially it's just um, someone navigating you know what, I don't think, I'm just gonna let you watch it because I think we only really have a few more minutes. But, um, you know, if you want to see someone who actually relies on a screen reader and how they go about navigating different pages, um, this is really good. And, um, so the, the last thing is essentially the accessibility audit. So these are going to be the automated. Um, so we already saw a wave, we saw lighthouse. Um, essentially, we saw the accessibility tree in Firefox. Again, um, lots of different options to run these automated audits. But one thing that you should know is they only catch about 40% of accessibility issues. Um, it's going to be 40% you know, it's, it's still 40% better than not using them, but just be aware that there's always more testing uh, for you to do specifically. So I just added some links in terms of Wave, um, X, Lighthouse, Accessibility. Um, also, if you're using, for example, React, uh, Angular, whatnot, as your framework, uh, you also have essentially different NPM modules. So for React, um, using, for example, like X Core React, um, and just adding that uh, for your uh, development um, to run whenever you run your develop application in development, it's just going to catch various different errors. Um, so it's really it's really great to just automate all of that. And yeah, I guess the last. So we saw a few different options. So in here. And here I have like the Nike app and I'm just going to, we're just going to run a few different. Um, so we have this Nike app. And again, if you start running these uh, accessibility audits on different sites, you're going to see some issues. Uh, I'm going to close this and I'm just going to, wow, this is really not loading. Okay, this is loading now. Um, so if we run wave, essentially, we're going to get like, you know, a series of, you know, different errors, warnings. Uh, it's just a little slow. So I know we're already at 730, but if you just want to hang out for a minute, I think this is actually going to. Anyway, uh, so when the, when this does decide to run, uh, you are essentially going to get all the different errors and warnings associated with the site. Maybe I'll just close it. Maybe it's just we seem off. to get some examples throughout the event. Yeah, um, that that is a good point. Um, I think the only one that's left that I haven't really talked about is Lighthouse, and this is just available in DevTools and Chrome. Um, so if we just opened up to wow 
Uh, so this is, you don't have to install anything. It's just in DevTools and you can essentially just run it. So this is for Etsy. Um, and I'm just going to run accessibility on desktop, but you can actually generate a report that's going to have like best practices, performance, SEO, various other things. This does, this is actually going to be one of the slightly slower ones, uh, but then it's also going to come back at you with a score. And that score is really nice because it's going to tell you, you know, you're at like 30% for accessibility or you're at 100%. So it's, um, it's very visual in terms of in terms of like actually assigning a number. All right, so are there any questions that I can answer for folks as this is finishing up? I know we only have a few of us left, but anyone can feel free to come off of mute if you'd like. Are all, sure. yeah. um, are all of the auditing tools that you're using, are they free or have you tried yes. any like paid versions? Um, all of these are free um, in terms of, um, so I actually, I think, um, you know, I think if you're there, um, so I don't work for a company. I mean, I do work for a company right now, but it's obviously like a university and I don't actually like write code uh, full time as part of my job. I mostly teach. Um, but yes, there are paid versions and um, and they're also just uh, like Axe, which is uh, created by Deck Labs. Um, so Deck Labs actually has um, extra tools available if you if you want to run essentially more tests around accessibility. Um, and that's obviously a really good idea in terms of your specific application. Um, I think unless you're working for a company that's willing to pay for those services, I don't know that you want to go into those expenses. Um, because again, you, you are going to get about like 40% of the errors essentially for free, but you're not actually going to get 100% of the errors with a paid. Um, what, the, the only way you're really going to get to 100%, understanding 100% of your errors is essentially hiring uh, some sort of team to come in and like manually do an accessibility audit. At least as far as I'm aware of, I'm sure there's companies sort of working on a way to like automate everything 100%. Uh, but I think a lot of things are actually really difficult to pick up. Um, so anyway, this is essentially the accessibility score. Um, so there's just like a few things missing. And again, this is just something that you can, um, you know, take a moment and start fixing. And if you run these accessibility audits on most websites, there's always things to fix uh, because again, they're big websites and people have been working on them for like usually at least a decade. Lots of different, um, lots of different practices um, that are not best in terms of accessibility um, got past code reviews. All right, so it looks like there are no other questions. So I guess we're gonna end it here for today. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Katarina. Um, you had some thank yous throughout as people were dipping out. Um, thank you for the resources and you are much appreciated. Um, I know I have a lot to dig into um, and I'll, I sent out an email with some of the links that came up both tonight and in when people were RSVPing, some people shared their tools that they like to use as well. So those cool. are sent out. Excellent. Alrighty. Have a good night, everybody. See you next night. time. Bye.